coronavirus pandemic. We need to get a rate of infection down. And spurring an economic recovery. We need to make sure that everybody is afloat right now, that we keep the money flowing and that we uh, help everybody recover in an equitable way. To police reform. We need more accountability, more outside review of when officers use force. And healing the wounds of racial injustice. We're dealing with the accumulated effects of 400 years of systemic and institutional racism. Two candidates from the same party with different paths to Olympia. I have a depth and breadth of experience that prepares me uh, to uh, uh, take on the challenges of being our state's lieutenant governor. We don't have D.C. lobbyists and Wall Street firms on our side. We're a people-powered campaign. Right here on Como, the debate for lieutenant governor starts now. TVW Studios in Olympia. Candidates Marco Leas and Denny Heck meet to debate in the campaign for Washington's lieutenant governor. This debate has been organized by the Washington State Debate Coalition and its premier media partners. Seattle City Club founded the coalition in 2016 to enhance voter access to those who hold and seek our state's highest offices. Thank you to the Washington State Debate Coalition's lead sponsor, AARP Washington. To preserve social distancing, the moderators are seated in the main studio, while the candidates are alone in separate rooms elsewhere in the building. This debate will be moderated by four reporters from across the state. Jessica Chatter Castro, King 5, Michelle Esteban, Como News, Scott Leadingham, Northwest Public Broadcasting, and Mike McClanahan from TVW. And good evening from the TVW studios in Olympia. Glad you were with us and welcome to our candidates, Senator Marco Leas and Congressman Denny Heck. Gentlemen, I want to confirm that you both can hear us from the studio. Yes, we can. Thank you. Loud and clear. All right, thank you. The candidates are alone in their rooms upstairs from the studio. They have no campaign or production staff with them, and they are not allowed to bring any notes, phones, or computers. The candidates have screens where they can see each other, us, the moderators, and digital time cues. Tonight's debate is unusual in that it features two Democrats. In our state's primary system, the top two vote-getters from that primary move on to the general election regardless of political party. Here are the key duties of the lieutenant governor. Filling in when the governor is away or unable to fulfill their duties, presiding over the state senate, working with legislative leaders, and serving on several boards and committees. And here's the format for tonight's debate. We will begin with opening statements. Questions will be asked of both candidates who will have timed answers and rebuttals. The moderator may ask a follow-up question, and we will end with closing statements. Now, as you watch the debate, we invite you to join the conversation on social media using the hashtag WAELEX. That's hashtag W-A-E-L-E-X. The candidates have agreed they will not interrupt each other and the moderators will enforce the rules. With that, it is time for opening statements. We flipped a coin and Marco Elias will go first. Mr. Elias, you have two minutes. Well, good evening. I'd like to begin by thanking the Washington State Debate Coalition and TVW for hosting us tonight. I'm Marco Elias, a lifelong Washingtonian, state senator and college professor running to be our next lieutenant governor. Growing up, my dad was a carpenter, my mom was a school lunch lady. They taught my sister and me the importance of hard work and the value of a good education. I was the first in my family to go to college, and after I graduated, I came home and started a small business with my dad, building energy efficient homes. Fast forward to today, and I have the honor of representing those same neighborhoods I grew up in as our state senator. Now, I don't have to tell you about the challenges we face in this moment. We are all witnessing history. And I believe this moment calls for bold, transformational change. And I believe I'm uniquely deliver, positioned to deliver that change. Now, the best way to know what someone will do in office is to look at what they've already done. As our Senate Majority Floor Leader, we've done a lot. We expanded health care to more Washingtonians than ever before. We passed $200 million in early critical COVID relief. And we expanded college financial aid to more families than ever before without raising taxes on working people. Now, my opponent, the congressman, has a long career in public service, and I commend him for that. And he deserves the retirement that he announced last fall. I think we can all appreciate that. And while it's true in the past, the lieutenant governor's role was more low profile, our current lieutenant governor, Cyrus Habib, has charted a different course. He's been a forceful advocate for higher education. 
He's stood up to injustice and he's broken down barriers. I am so honored to have his support. And I'll break down barriers too, as our state's first openly gay statewide executive. As our next Lieutenant Governor, I will go to work fighting for middle-class families just like the one I grew up in, fighting for better education, more opportunities, and an economy that works for everyone. I look forward to the debate tonight. Mr. Leas, thank you. Now to Mr. Heck, two minutes for your statement. Well, thank you, and thank you as well to the Washington Debate Coalition and TVW and participating partners. I think the most important thing you can know about a candidate for any office, regardless of what it is, is what are their values. So here are mine. First and foremost, I believe in the importance of standing up, speaking out, and advocating on behalf of the vulnerable, and never giving up in our fight for more social and economic and racial justice. We have a chance to do something in that regard now, and we must seize it. I also believe in the power of a strong education system and a strong public education system. The state constitution mandates it, and it's the right thing to do. Those are my values. I bring also to this job a unique depth and breadth of experiences. I was elected to five terms in the State House of Representatives. I served as majority leader. I chaired the historic subcommittee on basic education because of my belief in strong public schools. I was chief of staff to Governor Booth Gardner, where I served as the chief operating officer for all of state government. I then co-founded and was the first longtime CEO of TVW, very, your very favorite statewide public affairs network, because I believe in transparency and openness in state government. I entered the private sector, co-founded a company with two employees, and we grew it to more than 300 thanks to their hard work. And then, of course, I've had the last eight years the honor to serve in the state in the United States House of Representatives. These values, these experiences are gonna come in handy as we confront the triple crises in Washington State, the continuing COVID pandemic, the economic recession, and the budget shortfall. We have to crush the, uh, we have to crush the virus, but to do that, we have to do it based on science. And we have to rebuild our economy better than before with more broadly shared prosperity and more environmentally sustainable practices. And when we deal with the budget shortfall, we must protect the vulnerable. I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight. Mr. Heck, thank you. Let's begin now with our questions. Mr. Heck, you will go first. And Mr. Leas, you will have a chance to answer the same question. As we've pointed out, you both have held elected office and you are both Democrats. Why should Republicans listen to tonight's debate? And what are the key differences that set you apart from your opponent. Mr. Heck, you'll go first. You have a minute and 15 seconds. Well, we're going to have a lieutenant governor in January, and it behooves every citizen, whether they're a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, to come to a conclusion and make a decision about who would best serve the interest of our state. As I said during my opening statement, I'm offering myself as a candidate with not just these values I've enumerated, but with this depth and breadth of experience, which will come in handy as we deal with these problems. Listen, this COVID crisis is entering its third surge. It isn't going away soon. And it's gonna take somebody who is committed to basing our decisions on science and data to, to be able to combat it. And if we want to, the economy to recover, the only way for the economy to recover is to defeat the virus. Okay, Mr. Leah, same question to you. Why should voters who are not Democrats listen tonight? And what are the key differences between you and your opponent? Well, I think in politics these days, it can feel like the gulf between us is so deep that we can't bridge past it. And I know that feeling in my own life. Uh, today is actually the anniversary of when I came out to my family and friends. And I remember that deep sense of isolation, that disconnection, that sense that uh, maybe I would lose relationships that were really valuable to me. But what I learned through that experience was that one label doesn't define us and that when we bridge those uh, those differences, we can find common ground together. I brought those lessons with me to the Senate. I was proud to partner with Senator Curtis King of Yakima to pass the largest transportation investment in our state history. I've worked with Senator Jeff Holy from Spokane on expanding health care or uh, higher education access to more Washingtonians. And as our next Lieutenant Governor, I'm going to bring those experiences, my relationships in the state Senate, and a proven bipartisan record to work for the people of Washington. We're going to beat COVID-19, we're going to rebuild our economy, and we're going to make sure that more people share in our prosperity as well as in 
access to health care and educational opportunities. I've done it before, and I'll do it again. You will each have time for rebuttals. Mr. Heck, you have 30 seconds. So I can't help but go back to the premise of your question initially as to why should any Republican vote in a race. It's the same reason every American, I believe, should exercise their franchise every opportunity that they have. I believe it's a sacred responsibility. I'm somebody who comes from a family who had a member who gave his last full measure of devotion to this country. And it is unconscionable to me to miss the opportunity to participate in this great democracy, irrespective of your partisan identity. Mr. Elias, you have 30 seconds. Well, I think to face the challenges we have in front of us, we have to be able to bridge that partisan divide. And my record in the Senate for the last six years has been working with Democrats and Republicans when I was in the minority and in the majority in the Senate to deliver real change for Washingtonians. That's why this January we had the strongest and best paid family medical leave program take effect right before the pandemic struck because Democrats and Republicans, led by me and so many others, came together, got the job done. That's what we need to do again in this moment. I would like to ask some follow-up questions. As Mr. Elias pointed out in his opening statements, Mr. Heck, some people raised eyebrows when you announced that you would run for lieutenant governor as you had announced your retirement last year. Why not just step aside? I announced my retirement from Congress. Uh, I was, as I said at the time, my soul was weary of that politically toxic environment. I never said that I was retiring altogether, nor did I say that I had last lost my passion for public service. In fact, most of my public service career, as I've enumerated, has been devoted to state government. It is where my heart it is, is, it is where my passion is. And I think there are a lot of problems here that I can bring my experience to bear on helping our state move forward. Okay, Mr. Heck, thank you. Mr. Leas, to you. As majority floor leader, some people would argue that you currently hold a more influential role as far as party politics is concerned. So why do you want to be lieutenant governor? Well, I'm not interested in party politics. I'm interested in delivering for middle class families just like the one I grew up in. And as our current lieutenant governor, Cyrus Habib, has shown, this office can be a game changer in bringing the kind of changes we need in our state. We need to get health care to more Washingtonians. We need to continue to invest in educational opportunities. And we've got to rebuild an economy that works for everyone, not just those at the top, the millionaires and the billionaires and the big corporations. We need proven bipartisan leadership that can meet this moment and lead our state forward. That's why I threw my my name in the ring and that's why I'm running. Okay, thank you to both. And the next question is for both candidates, but this time Mr. Leas will answer first and then Mr. Heck. Uh, Senator Leas, you are considered a progressive Democrat, more in the left-leaning uh, part of your caucus. And Congressman Heck, you are considered a moderate Democrat, more to the right of some members of your uh, well, your caucus. And as Senate president, the lieutenant governor uh, can cast a tie-breaking vote in the Senate and also chairs the powerful Senate Rules Committee, which can kill any bill by preventing it from ever coming up for a vote. So if elected, would you take an active role in trying to ensure equal opportunities for bills from both parties or factions within parties to be heard or would you prioritize bills that align with your political ideals and vision for the state? Mr. Leas, you have one minute, 15 seconds for your answer. Well, if you look at the last six years of my work in the Senate, you'll see that I've worked with Democrats and Republicans to get things done. It's also why three quarters of our Senate Democratic Caucus, the most conservative members of our caucus and some of the most progressive have endorsed my campaign. They know that I'm a proven bipartisan leader. And while I bring my own values, I bring my own commitment to making sure that middle class families, just like the one I grew up in, get a fair shake from our state government, I will work with anybody to move our state forward. I've worked with Senator King to invest in transportation in his community and in mine. I've worked with Senator Holy to invest in more access to higher education in Eastern Washington and in Western Washington. I think our values and the things that bring us to politics are important, but what's more important is to deliver change for Washington families. That's what my record has been over the last six years in the Senate and over the 12 years I've served in our legislature. It's why I'm so trusted in the legislature to deliver real change on big issues because people 
people know that when I sit down at the table with them, I will negotiate in good faith to find agreements that will move everybody forward in our state. That's just the practicality of what we need to do this in this moment, uh, is to help our state move forward together, not by drawing lines, not by labeling people, but by working together to overcome our differences and deliver. And uh, Mr. Heck, you have a minute 15 for your answer. I think bipartisan solutions should always be our goal. Look, they're not always going to be possible, but they should always be our goal. I'm somebody who still believes in principled compromise. It's my record in the United States Congress when I led the effort for the sweeping Puget Sound Recovery Act that passed in a bipartisan manner out of the U.S. House, and when I led for the longest ever reauthorization of the family wage job-creating export-import bank, which creates and is responsible for thousands of jobs in Washington state. But really, the question is, why are bipartisan solutions to be desired? And the answer is because they're sturdier. Now, we've all lived long enough and seen enough elections where the tide comes in and the tide goes out. And if all we're going to do is adopt one side just to be repealed when the other side comes into power, then we haven't provided stability or sturdiness to our solutions. No, they're not always going to be possible, but they all, but they ought to always be the objective of what we're trying to do. That's been my track record in Congress, and that's how I would be Lieutenant Governor if I were given the honor to be so. Well, Mr. Leas, you now have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. Well, I think what's critically important for voters to consider right now is that in January, we have some real big challenges on the horizon. And I think voters need to consider who is the best equipped to work within the Senate right now to make change. And when you look at my record, I've been in the Senate making change all these years, advancing healthcare access, advancing educational access, and helping our small businesses and struggling families. With all due respect to my friend, the Congressman, he has been in Washington, D.C., a much different environment, a much different situation. I bring on the ground experience here in Olympia delivering change. You're out of time, Mr. Heck, your rebuttal, 30 seconds. Well, thank you. I, I think the senator's premise seems to be that it always must be an insider. Uh, well, frankly, my experience managing small, medium, and large organizations is that if you're seeking bold and transformational change, it often isn't going to come from a longstanding member of the inside of the club. And that's what he is frankly suggesting. I actually think the Washington State Legislature and the Washington State Senate could use a fresh perspective as long as they have the experience to do the job and clearly I do. All right, so uh, we have one follow-up here, and this will, again, we'll start with Mr. Leas. Um, coming from the Senate floor leader role where you have to sometimes be sort of uh, energetic, maybe even combative in, in pushing your, your policy priorities, um, what sort of tone could we expect from you as Senate president and as far as what you would set uh, the atmosphere like in the Senate? Well, I had the good fortune of serving as the minority leader, a uh, minority floor leader, before I became our majority floor leader. So I knew when we took over uh, the majority in 2017 that we had to chart a different path. We had to make sure that we were listening to both sides. And as our floor leader, I have ensured that our debates are wide ranging and that we listen to all perspectives, and then we have a vote, and we move forward with those solutions that we voted on. As Lieutenant Governor, I will do the exact same thing. We will facilitate a broad debate so everyone's voices are heard, and then we'll have a vote, and then we'll move forward. And just to, to clarify, we will have 30 seconds for this response. Uh, uh, Mr. Heck, uh, you also, coming from Washington, D.C., you mentioned yourself, the, the atmosphere, the, the, the divisiveness there. What sort of tone would you bring to the Senate if elected Lieutenant Governor? 30 seconds. Well, the number one job of the presiding officer is to competently administer the rules of the Senate. Uh, I will note that I have hundreds of hours of presiding over the State House of Representatives when I was a member, and it's the same exact rule book. Uh, and above and beyond that, it must have, the Lieutenant Governor must have a rock hard commitment to fairness and impartiality in striking a tone to the degree uh, that he can elevate the debate to a civil level. That's not what's happening in Washington, D.C., and I sure, was, I sure don't want to see it begin to infect uh, Olympia. Okay, well, thank you both very much. We will move on. Gentlemen, this region is home to numerous sovereign native tribes, and many but not all are federally recognized, and there are complex legal issues about law enforcement jurisdiction and taxation 
on tribal lands. In fact, last year, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Yakima Nation in a case where the state of Washington was suing for collection of tax revenue from a business on Yakima Nation land. You are both running to be a high-ranking statewide official. How would you approach issues of tribal sovereignty versus the interests of the state? Mr. Heck, you go first, a minute 15. Well, thank you very much. When I was chief of staff to Governor Gardner, we memorialized the centennial accord between the tribes and state government. It was, in fact, the first written document between tribes and a state government in the United States of America, and I've written that it was one of the proudest moments in my life. I think the key to understanding this is acknowledging that these Indian tribes are nations that do have sovereignty, and that, that we also have a trust responsibility to them as a, as a result of the compacts that we entered into them, the treaties we entered into with them, and those responsibilities last in perpetuity. And it's been my experience working as often as I have and as uh, deeply as I have in Indian country over the years, that the key is prior consultation, that before you take action that affects them, they get a seat at the table, they get to be listened to, they are, after all, sovereign. They've been here a lot longer than we have. And I might just add, parenthetically, another one of the proudest moments I had in Congress was the privilege to rename the Nisqually Wildlife Refuge for my dear friend, Billy Frank Jr., who was a great man, uh, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, won the Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Award, and he, he's somebody that um, is a great man, and I miss him to this day. Thank you. Mr. Elias, a minute 15. I think the first thing we've got to do is acknowledge that our indigenous people in this state have been here since time immemorial and have stewarded the land and waters uh, of our state long before uh, white settlement arrived here. I had the pleasure of serving as a city council member in Mukilteo, where some of the first treaties were signed with our native tribes. And I know that we have not lived up as a state or as a nation to the promises that were made to those indigenous people at Point Elliott. It is time to uh, begin a conversation about how we repair that damage. And the first step we can do is to recognize and respect the sovereignty of our tribal nations. I was proud this year to help lead the effort uh, to recognize the tribe's power to tax themselves and collect taxes on tribal lands. And we memorialize that in the form of a compact with the Tulalip tribes. And I look forward to building on that moving forward. We also have worked to cement an economic development partnership with tribal communities around the state. We need to do more to expand health care and broadband and to work in partnership to lift up all of our communities. And we've also got to recognize uh, the leadership role that our indigenous peoples have played in ensuring the protection of our clean air and water. I was so proud of the work we did to protect our orca in conjunction with our native tribes, and I look forward to working on the threat of climate change with our indigenous communities as well. And Mr. Heck, 30 seconds for a rebuttal if you'd like. I, I don't. I thought Senator Lee said it well. <laughs> okay, well, I do have one quick follow-up, though, on, on a similar topic. Some cities and municipalities have opted to mark Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day. The U.S. government, of course, still recognizes Columbus Day as a federal holiday. President Trump recently remarked on it at a rally as supporters booed and jeered the idea of Indigenous Peoples Day. What do you think about the idea of celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day? 30 seconds to you, Mr. Heck. I don't need 30 seconds. It's a great idea, and we ought to do it. <laughs> okay, and Mr. Leas? Yeah, I agree. I think it should be a state holiday, and we should honor the history and the legacy of the people who've been here since time immemorial. Great. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, this next question is for both of you, but I'm going to start with you, Senator. It is possible if you are elected to serve as lieutenant governor, you could end up serving as governor of our state. A lot has to happen first. In the event that Governor Inslee is reelected for a third term and Joe Biden should win the White House, it is believed that Inslee could possibly be tapped for a position with the Biden administration. I have, if that scenario does play out, I have two questions for you. One, why are you the better candidate to serve as governor? And two, would you make a run for the governor's office in 2021? Senator, we'll start with you. You have one minute and 15 seconds. 
Well, thank you so much. This is one of the most important uh, roles of the Lieutenant Governor, and I wouldn't run if I weren't qualified to step up. I've been proud to work alongside Governor Inslee to take bold action to confront, confront the climate crisis, to expand health care and pass our first public option, and to pass the new Long-Term Care Trust Act to help our seniors. Uh, I'm excited to partner with him as our next Lieutenant Governor, and I've also been recognized by my Senate colleagues who have elected me both to a leadership position but have endorsed me in this campaign. They know the quality of my leadership they know that I can lead our state forward. Now, I am not seeking this office uh, as a retirement job or as a springboard to higher office. I am running to be an advocate for working people in our state. And I don't know uh, Congressman Heck's motivations. I can just say that I am running because I am eminently qualified to take on this task. Now, if for whatever reason, uh, Governor Inslee cannot complete his term, I would serve temporarily until the people of Washington elect a new governor, and then I would return to my post as Lieutenant Governor. This is the job I want. This is the job I'm qualified for, and it's the best place for me to make the bold transformational changes we have in this moment in our state, expanding health care, education, building an economy that works for everyone. Senator, thank you. Congressman Heck, same question. If that scenario does play out, why would you be the better candidate to serve as governor? And while you have said publicly you would not run in 2021, is there a circumstance that would cause you to reconsider? Well, as I've indicated before, I'm a former chief of staff to one of our state's great governors, Booth Gardner, and in that capacity functioned as the chief operating officer. That's about as close as you can be to governor without being governor as is possible. Uh, and I also think that the rest of my life experiences would help me do a better job at that should that set of circumstances arise. But I have said from day one on the day I made my announcement that under no circumstances would I seek re-election as governor, which would occur in November of 21. I think the reason why I would not is really important here. Whomever is governor in the January 21 session, without having been governor, without having run for it for a year, is going to be airdropped into dealing with these three crises we've talked about, the pandemic, the economic recession, and the budget shortfall. And they must be focused like a laser on helping to solve those problems and not be off setting up a campaign and running for governor. And I won't because I think the voters of the state deserve whomever takes that on to have their whole heart, their whole mind, and their whole spirit leaning into the solution of those very difficult problems that are so challenging for our families throughout our communities in this state. Mr. Heck, thank you. Mr. Leas, you have a rebuttal, 30 seconds. Well, I won't be airdropped into Olympia, as the congressman suggests. I've been there for the last eight years, serving with Governor Inslee, making change together. And I've been developing the relationships and the confidence and the trust of my colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, in the legislature. So whether it's serving as lieutenant governor, which is the job I want, or if circumstances required as our governor, I will draw from that experience. I will draw from those relationships and that proven bipartisan record to deliver change. And like I said, uh, let the people of Washington elect a new governor governor, and then I hope to return back to the job I'm running for right now. Gentlemen, and thank you both. Let's talk about COVID-19 now. Even if there is a vaccine approved soon, the pandemic and its side effects could last years. Washingtonians are still getting sick, but they're also dealing with the financial and emotional hardships associated with lockdowns. So what is your plan to deal with COVID-19 in the next legislative session? Mr. Heck, you'll go first this time. You have a minute and 15 seconds for your answer. Well, again, and we can't say this often enough, we have to rely on the science and the data. We can't be running off chasing rumors and pretending that you can drink bleach and make yourself better. Uh, we have to listen to the experts on this, the public health professionals, and in fact, Probably the two most important decisions about how Washington State is going to deal with this are coming upon us because our Secretary of Health, Health John Wiesman, and our Chief Medical Officer and Science Officer, Kathy Lofi, are both leaving state government. And aside from the governor, they're probably the two most important people in the two most important decisions. Now, when it comes to what the legislature ought to do, I want to harken back to what I said earlier about protecting the vulnerable. Uh, we're going to have a lot of needs coming out of this situation, both with respect 
to providing health care for people who have been impacted, but also the mental health impacts of all of this isolation. And also, and very importantly, support for our public schools to be able to have as robust a distant learning approach as is possible, and then to be able, once that we are be able to do in-person learning, help those kids get back up to speed. And it will be incumbent upon the legislature to provide the resources to do that. Mr. Heck, thank you. Mr. Leas, you have a minute and 15 seconds for the same question. What is your plan to deal with COVID-19 in the next legislative session? Well, first of all, I think we should note we have been through so much this year, and I want to take a moment to thank my fellow Washingtonians for all that we have sacrificed. Together, we have saved tens of thousands of lives because of the work we have done this year. And it hasn't been easy and it hasn't been fun. Uh, I was proud of the work we did in the legislature on a bipartisan fashion to pass $200 million in immediate COVID relief. And we targeted that relief at hospitals, at nursing homes, at buying critical PPE when we needed it most. Now, unfortunately, in the other Washington, a different story was unfolding. Congress approved a $500 billion slush fund that's bailed out private jet makers that are Trump donors. Uh, it's provided billions in fees to the big banks and even companies that Congressman Heck is part owner of have received bailout funds. Meanwhile, businesses here in our state continue to struggle and families continue to struggle to make ends meet. We've got to focus the COVID relief on the folks who are suffering most in this moment. I think we should use the state's rainy day fund to help our small businesses who are struggling right now buy the equipment to stay open and get open. We need to provide rent relief to families who are struggling to pay bills and small landlord landlords who are struggling to get those bills paid. We need to be focused on the people who need the, mo the help most right now, not those who are well connected. Okay, thank you. Um, you do have time for rebuttals, 30 seconds each, Mr. Heck. Senator Leas made this point at last week's debate. Just get to yes back there. And the truth of the matter is that means one of two things. He either wants us to accept what President Trump has laid on the table, uh, including, for example, providing billions of dollars in Betty DeVos's plan for private, including for-profit schools, or the only other alternative is, he thinks he can just be put into a room with President Trump and have him bent to his will and do a better job of negotiating this than Speaker Pelosi, who has, who has successfully negotiated four packages totaling more than $3 trillion thus far. Mr. Leas, your response, 30 seconds. Well, I would just say, as our Lieutenant Governor, I will not support a slush fund that bails out private jet makers and that benefits companies that I have an, an ownership interest myself. We've got to focus on struggling small businesses. We've got businesses who need help buying the equipment to reopen. Uh, we have families who are struggling to pay the rent and small landlords who aren't getting paid and have the mortgage themselves to pay. We need to use our resources to help the people who need it most right now, not those who are well-connected or who have lobbyists. I do want to follow up with a question related to COVID-19, and that is our schools. It's been a school year unlike any other, one that's been very difficult for our families here in Washington. School districts have also seen significant drops in enrollment in some cases, and they've struggled to provide internet and other supplies for students. So what legislative measures do you support to help schools during the pandemic? And this time you will have one minute to answer. Mr. Heck, you'll go first. Well, thank you. It's a fundamentally a question of resources. We have to make sure that every child gets their device and their connectivity. The teachers have the appropriate training to pull this off. Those students have a constitutional right under Article 9, Section 1, which provides that the state will make ample provision for the education of all children, and that it is our paramount duty. But let's go back to what Senator Lee has just said, because he said it twice. I assume he is referring to some common stock I have in some company. He is therefore impugning my motives. One week ago, in a debate, he said that he would strictly enforce the rule in the state Senate not to impugn the motives of, uh, not to allow members to impugn the motives of one another. He just impugned my motives. I think how you campaign is how you will govern. In no fashion did I support any legislation uh, to receive self-benefit or to self-serve in any way, shape, or form, and I resent the implication that he makes with that. Mr. Leas, I would like to give you time to respond to what Mr. Heck just said, but I also want to ask you the original question. You'll have a chance to answer that as well. What legislative measures do you support to help schools during this pandemic? You'll have one minute. Well, on the schools question, I will say that we must 
provide broadband access and internet connections to families who are struggling. And we need to tap, again, the state's rainy day fund uh, to help fund those critical connections. Congressman Heck is right. We have a constitutional obligation uh, to support the education of our schools. We've also got to make sure before any students come back that our, our teachers and our staff have all the PPE and all the training in order to do that safely. I will say on the other question of Congressman Heck's investments, he's actually part owner of a couple of movie theaters that have received bailout loans uh, from that slush fund that was approved in Congress. So this isn't just about stock ownership. This is about having a personal stake. And I think we've got to draw bright lines and be clear uh, that when we are focusing on assistance, it's got to go to those who are struggling most. And we've got to draw clear lines here. I know it's uncomfortable, but I think Washingtonians deserve to know, and they deserve to have a leader who's focused on helping get assistance to where it needs to go. Thank you both. Well, uh, as I'm sure you're both aware, the state is currently projected to come up about $4.4 billion short over the next few years. And while that could change, uh, it already has come down from $9 billion uh, back in June. In the event that there is a significant shortfall that cannot be addressed with federal aid or state reserves, specifically which state programs or services do you think should be cut first if cuts are necessary? And which tax increases or new taxes would you support if that seemed necessary? Uh, Mr. Leas, you will be first. You have a minute 15 to respond. Well, I will just say that we should not begin with a cuts approach. We did that in the last recession, and we are still paying for the consequences of it to this day. It shredded our mental health safety net, and we have seen thousands of Washingtonians suffer as a result of it. So we need to start with a conversation about how we use our reserves, how we use federal support, and look at new progressive revenue. I support closing ab abusive big business tax loopholes. I led the effort in the 2019 session to close a loophole that benefited international investment companies. Companies. It's an example of what we can do to ensure that our tax code is fair. I also support uh, uh, passing a, an excise tax on capital gains so that the wealthiest Washingtonians, those billionaires who have made more money while we've been in the midst of this crisis, chip in to help support core state services. If we do have to make cuts, we need to apply an equity lens to that decision as well. We need to make sure that the cuts we're making are smart. My dad, uh, the carpenter, uh, taught me that you measure twice and you cut once. We've got to be careful that the decisions we're making aren't doubling down on historic inequities. And that's why I would look at policies like our mass incarceration policies as a place that we could make savings. We incarcerate four times as many people as our neighbors to the north in British Columbia, and their communities are just as safe. Let's use an equity lens as we make any efficiencies. And Mr. Heck, uh, you have a minute 15. Uh, where would you make those uh, cuts or raise those taxes? So I think it behooves the legislature and uh, the governor on a year-round basis, on a regular basis, to look for ways to economize, not just during times of recession. I have said that I thought that the lieutenant governor's office, which has doubled in size in the last four years, should participate in this. But I want to hearken back again to what I said at the top, what my most important value is, which is to protect the vulnerable. And I think whatever measures or actions we take going forward should protect the vulnerable. And I'll add to that. I think we should also protect the institutions that are going to help our economy grow, like higher education, and in particular, our state, state's community and technical colleges. Uh, I do think that the use of the rainy day fund is prudent because I think it's raining. And then if we get to revenue, I do think where we start is with the principle and the standard that we're not going to adopt anything that is going to render our state's tax system, which is already the most regressive in the country, any more regressive. In fact, what we ought to do is contemplate any combination of revenues that will render it more progressive and less regressive than it currently is. That's the standard that we ought to begin with. And Mr. Leas, you have uh, 30 seconds for rebuttal. Well, these are going to be difficult choices, and that's why I think it's really critical we have leadership in the role of lieutenant governor that have the experience and the relationships in the Senate and a proven bipartisan record of delivering change. When we close that abusive big business tax loophole for international investment companies, we got bipartisan support to get it done. I serve on the Senate Budget Committee right now. I know the leaders who are gonna be making these critical decisions. I can be a voice for everyday Washingtonians, just like the middle class family I grew up in, to make sure that we are not impacting people negatively, that we are making these decisions in a wise and prudent way. And Mr. Heck, you have 30 seconds for rebuttal. 
I think Senator Leas would be an excellent advocate in a continuing role on the Budget Committee where he'll actually be in a better position to see that which he would like to have happen occur than he would presiding over the State Senate. Okay, so uh, we're going to have some follow-up time here. You'll each have a minute to respond. I want to tackle two issues with this. Number one, I want to talk about Initiative 976 to limit car tab fees, which was approved by a majority of voters in 35 counties last November, but was recently struck down by the state Supreme Court. Uh, voters have made it clear they want vehicle fee cuts and a fair vehicle evaluation system if elected. Would you make that a priority? And on top of that, Mr. Leas, you just referred to corporate tax loopholes, corporate tax breaks as a place you would look for funding. Um, could you specify what those are and answer the, the 976 question, please? At one minute. Yeah, thank you. You know, I will uh, just echo what my friend the congressman said, which is we have the most upside down tax system in the country. In Washington right now, if you're working your way into the middle class, you pay as many as 15 cents on the dollar in state and local taxes, while those at the very top pay just a penny. We've got to turn that upside down. So when it comes to those uh, abusive big business tax loopholes, we need to look to places uh, and that we have a citizens commission that's identified this uh, to look for opportunities to make a difference. The courts just threw out the tax we approved on big banks. Uh, I think that we've got to go back to that and make sure that big banks are paying more. Uh, in terms of you know what we can do in the in the broader budget to make these efficiencies and to make the, the steps that are going forward, I think we've got to keep a laser focus on ensuring that uh, folks who are in the middle class, who are trying to uh, find affordable housing, get access to health care, get access to education, that they're protected, that we're focusing on those who have benefited while the rest of us have suffered during this economy and ask them to chip in more. And uh, now, Mr. Heck, if you could just, with one minute, respond to the question about the uh, initiative, which was struck down, but also uh, give any detail that you can about what sorts of, of areas of the state budget you think could be targeted, if need be. Well, listen, when you have a system, a tax system that is as upside down as ours is, as for long as it is, inevitably what's going to happen because it's not broadly enough based and because frankly we don't ask enough of those who have the ability to pay, is you keep jacking up the excise taxes, whether it's the, the car tab tax or frankly uh, cigarette taxes or beer taxes or whatever you have in order to fill revenue holes. And it's a consequence of the system being upside down to begin with. It's not, it's not broadly enough based. Now, with respect to where it is that we should seek economies, um, I've long been a believer that we have to be very careful how state government undertakes major technology projects. Uh, I think there's a lot of expertise that can be brought to bear through private partner, uh, private public partnerships to make sure that we don't have the kinds of problems, for example, that we did when we had the overwhelming applications on the employment security uh, department in the most recent run-up of uh, unemployment applications. We could do better in that regard and save taxpayer money. We are out of time. Thank you both for your responses on that issue, and I will uh, pass it to my colleague. Uh, Mr. Heck, I'm glad you brought up that idea of protecting the institutions that help our economy versus protecting the most vulnerable people in our society, and that's part of the basis of this next question. In this position, uh, you would play a role in international relations and trade, and much of central and eastern Washington uh, produce big agricultural exports, but that farm economy is largely dependent on farm workers and agricultural warehouse employees who this year, who uh, were disproportionately hard hit by COVID-19, they often say they are not adequately protected by their employers or by the state. How might you represent the interests of farm operators on the international stage while also looking out for the health and safety of workers? Mr. Heck, uh, first to you, a minute 15. Well, those aren't incompatible goals and they're not mutually exclusive. I think we can do both and frankly, I think we should do both. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that I grew up in a rural area working in a farm. Uh, when I was in the state legislature, I represented a portion of Eastern Washington and a lot of farming country. And I have a lot of a rural uh, territory in the congressional district I have the honor to represent. So I have a lot of muscle memory when it comes to representing rural areas and agricultural areas. And they're an integral part of our state. 
Uh, and indeed, as chair of the Legislative Committee on Economic Development and International Relations, the Lieutenant Governor is in a position. I visited many foreign capitals in my capacity as a member of the Intelligence Committee, meeting with the highest ranking diplomats. I've made a priority in Congress working on measures to help with export, including of agricultural products, from completing the State Road 167 link into the Port of Tacoma to also uh, reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. And yes, the conditions under which some of our farm workers work are abysmal. We've made progress. We need to make more. And it is a fundamental responsibility of state government and the State Department of Labor to ensure that they have safe working conditions. A Hispanic child is eight times likelier to be hospitalized for COVID, and that's simply unacceptable. Right. Thank you. Uh, we have to move on. Mr. Elias, a minute 15. Well, I'll be clear that uh, my first priority is not going to be to take foreign trips and travel. I think we've got a lot of work to do here at home rebuilding our economy first. I was proud this year to partner with Republican Senator Judy Warnick of Moses Lake to pass a new statewide soil health initiative to ensure that we're investing in improving productivity on our farms and making state government a partner of our growers. Uh, I do think we have more work to do to protect our workers, though, and I think all Washingtonians need to really understand where our food comes from and the supply chain that's involved in that. I was proud to stand in solidarity with farm workers and, uh, and activists from uh, several Yakima area food processing sites this summer when they were seeking uh, better uh, working conditions and PPE in their work. I also am proud of the work we did in the Senate. As Senate Majority Floor Leader, I helped bring legislation to the floor uh, that examines farm labor contracting practices to make sure uh, that farm, uh, far, that uh, far, these large large agricultural interests don't exploit the law to exploit their workers. And we did that in a bipartisan way because Democrats and Republicans agree that we depend uh, on these workers uh, to deliver our food, to pick our food, to process our food. We need to make sure that they're being treated fairly. So I will continue to build on that record and make sure that we are taking care of the folks who bring us the food that we all depend on. Thank you. And Mr. Heck, we do have 30 seconds for a follow-up if you'd like. No, thank you though. Okay. Uh, let's move on then to an actual follow-up question. Sticking on the idea of international trade, the four dams on the Lower Snake River in Washington have been at the center of debate for decades, as I'm sure you both know. They help facilitate shipping and exports of crops along the Columbia and Snake Rivers. But some Native American tribes and environmental groups want them altered or removed to help protect salmon. But doing so would, uh, would take an act of Congress. Where do you stand on that issue, Mr. Heck, 30 seconds? Well, we've just recently had reissued yet another environmental impact statement and a biop with respect to it, and it set forth several conditions under which it believed that they could increase the fish runs, uh, and that's the plan going forward. As we go forward, however, uh, I think it is important that we do a much better job of collaborating uh, with our friends in Indian country. You know, the Northwest and Washington State in particular has a really good track record, a proud track record, frankly, of working with uh, multiple stakeholders through the timber, fish, and wildlife process and the habitat conversation, uh, conservation plan process. The best way to reach, again, a sturdy solution is to be collaborative with all the stakeholders and listen to all of them. Well, thank you. We're going to have to move on. Mr. Leas, 30 seconds. Yeah, last, uh, uh, last fall I had the chance to visit the uh, Snake River with my colleague Senator Mark Schessler, the Republican leader, and he took us on a tour. And as part of that tour, we also visited with the Nez Perce uh, tribe there to understand their perspectives. I think this is a place for government to government discussions with uh, our tribal partners around what the path forward is. And just like our orca recovery plans in Puget Sound, we need to make sure that the decisions we make are guided by science. What's going to have the best impact uh, for the whole ecosystem? I would also lean on a collaborative ap approach that brings uh, wheat farmers and affected community to the table to make sure everyone's perspective is being heard. Okay, thank you to you both. This question is for you both. Uh, we're gonna start with you, Senator. Boeing is back in the news even today. There has been talk about considering relocating its commercial division headquarters from Renton to Everett. Of course, this comes on the heels of the Boeing bombshell, the announcement to move the rest of its 787 Dreamliner production to South Carolina. It is indeed a competitive landscape. What is your strategy to keep Boeing's workforce here and ensure the next Boeing line will be built in Washington? Senator, you have one minute and 15 seconds. 
Well, I think, first of all, we have to express a deep sense of disappointment with, in my mind, the betrayal that we saw in the decision to move the 787 uh, to South Carolina. The legislature 20 years ago passed the largest tax break in American history to try and locate those jobs here, and the Boeing company has turned their back on that agreement. And I think we need to hold the line and be clear with them that before we do anything else on the tax front, we need a reckoning for this decision that's been made. Uh, but I do think the centerpiece of our competitiveness as a state, both in aerospace and across sectors, is in two things, our infrastructure and in our workforce training. And what I'm proud of is the investments we're making in infrastructure don't just benefit Boeing. They benefit all of our companies. And I was proud to lead the effort with Senator Curtis King of Yakima and others to pass the largest investment in our transportation system in our state's history. And it's building critical freight links all over Washington, from the I-90 pass uh, to the critical work that needs to be done in Seattle to get to the port. It's also building light rail to help alleviate congestion on our highways and create space uh, for our, our goods and our people to move around more efficiently. We also have to double down on investments in our worker training system. We need more trade school opportunities, more apprenticeships, and more community college slots so that people can get retrained and trained into the jobs of the future. Thank you very much. We will leave it there. Congressman, the same question, but I'll also ask you to weigh in as well on tax concessions for Boeing. You have one minute and 15 seconds. If the decision on where to consolidate the 787 line had been based on merit, it would be in Everett, Washington, period, full stop. Unfortunately, it was not. However, I don't think any of us are surprised by this decision. Disappointed, yes. I think, however, that what we should do is an inventory of our considerable assets as it relates to aerospace. We are still an aerospace center of excellence, and we have lots of companies in this space, pun intended. For example, Aerotech is right at the heart of developing the longest aloft battery-operated airplane in the history of the world, that test being done just this summer. We have an opportunity to lead the world in a lot of regards because of the engineering and the technical talent that resides here. Beyond that, we have to put first and foremost the people who are going to be dislocated by this, the some thousand machinists who will lose their jobs, and make sure that they have opportunities to skill up and to be able to receive any kind of support and training they need before they, so that they can get additional employment. And the same is true critically of the supply chain. You know, thousands of businesses support the assembly of airplanes, and we have to pay very careful attention to those small businesses throughout the state and make sure that we're there to help them as well. Thank you. Uh, time for rebuttal. Uh, Senator, you have 30 seconds. Well, I don't disagree with the Congressman. I would just add that I think uh, this creates additional urgency to diversify our economy. I've been really proud uh, to help grow the medical device sector in Canyon Park and in Bothell to diversify our manufacturing base. Also to work in close partnership with Governor Inslee to pursue uh, citing uh, large-scale manufacturing both in the clean energy space but also in maritime electrification. We're going to electrify our ferry fleet. We can become a center of excellence in that manufacturing space as well. We've got to locate more manufacturing jobs in our state and diversify beyond just aerospace. All right, thank you very much. Um, Congressman, you have 30 seconds. Well, I think I want to reiterate the importance of and the role of the state's community colleges and technical colleges with respect to making sure that we offer a significant amount of training that will enable people to transition to other family wage jobs so that they can, they can provide for their families. Uh, that's another reason why during this upcoming budget challenging session, it's important not to be reducing our support to that system. All right, thank you very much. I do have a follow-up for you. I want to go back to one of the other questions that one of the other moderators asked earlier, and this is with regard to the budget shortfall that the state is looking at, $4.4 billion, as you know, is projected. Both of you did talk about possible taxes, but we didn't hear anything about cuts. So I'd like both of you to address that, if you would. We'll start with you, Mr. Leason. You have 30 seconds. Yeah, as I shared uh, in response to that question, I think we need to apply an equity lens to any efficiencies that are going to be made. We know in the last recession our cuts disproportionately affected low income and communities of color. We've got to make sure this time we don't repeat that mistake. That's why I think we've got to revisit policies of mass incarceration as an example. We lock up four times as many people as our neighbors to the north in British Columbia, and their communities are just as safe. That is billions of dollars that we are spending over time on locking people up. I think we've got to revisit those decisions and find a better way. Thank you. Congressman, 30 seconds. 
Well, I did answer the question. You were specifically asked me where we would achieve economies, and I talked about, as an example, the number of massive uh, technology projects the state undertakes and the importance to consider public-private partnerships and so that we don't make mistakes that cost us uh, going forward. Any specific cuts that you would also address? Any others? Well, I th again, the idea that we should economize is not one that we should consider only during a recession. That should be a self-discipline that we apply day in and day out, even in good times. Where is it that we can do more with less without compromising services to the vulnerable? All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you both. Unfortunately, gentlemen, we are out of time for any more questions tonight, so we will move on to closing statements. Mr. Leas, you will go first this time. You have a minute and a half. Well, what a night. Uh, when I was in high school, I participated in debate club, and our coach, Mr. Hellman, always reminded us that the skills that we would learn there would help us out later in life, but I never imagined it would lead me to this place. Uh, I owe everything I am to our state to the opportunities uh, that I've had here. And for the last 12 years in the legislature, I've worked to pay it forward, to help families afford housing and health care, uh, save for college and build a better life. And I think in this moment, with this unique race, we have two Democrats for the first time in state history in a race like this, there is still a clear choice. After 40 years in politics, uh, Congressman Heck has just become too close to the special interests. And over the last eight years in Congress, we've seen some of those results. A COVID relief slush fund that benefits private jet makers while families in our state continue to struggle. My record is different. I have been a proven bipartisan leader in the legislature, investing in health care expansion and higher education, ensuring that all Washingtonians have access to basic state services in this critical time, and passing a COVID relief package that was focused on hospitals and nursing homes and PPE, not on helping out those who are well connected. Tonight, I'm asking for the opportunity to take my experience, my proven relationships in the state Senate, and my bipartisan record and put it to work for you, fighting to lift up our state, build an economy that works better for all of us. I humbly ask for your vote, and thank you for this opportunity. Mr. Leas, thank you. Mr. Heck, you will also have time for your closing statement, also 90 seconds. Well, thanks again to the Washington Debate Coalition and TVW and the participating partners. And thank you all for those of you who are watching. Uh, I encourage you in the strongest terms possible to make sure you exercise your right to vote between now and November 3rd. I invite you as well to visit our website, dennyheck.com, very straightforward, dennyheck.com and learn about my vision for the future of this state, a bright future for Washington State, and the policy proposals I've advanced in order to achieve that. Check out, if you will, as well, the number of uh, supporters that we have accumulated in this campaign. I'm proud and humbled by them. More than 110 organizations have endorsed our candidacy. 300 current and former local and state elected officials, including former Governors Locke and Gregoire and longtime serving Lieutenant Governor uh, Brad Owen, as well as, and this is incredibly humbling and gratifying, the endorsement of every single daily newspaper in this state that has endorsed thus far. Indeed, even Senator Leas's own hometown newspaper endorsed me. Indeed, I outpolled Senator Leas in his own county, his home county, where they know him best in the primary. That's very gratifying. But the greatest honor I could receive is if I had the opportunity to earn your vote. So please go to our website, dennyheck.com. But whatever you do, please remember to vote between now and November 3rd. And thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you both. We appreciate it. And that is the end of our debate tonight. We want to thank the candidates for this discussion of the issues on the campaign for lieutenant governor. We should mention that ballots have already been mailed to voters across the state. They must be postmarked or put in the drop box by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3rd. That is just 12 days away from now.